This afternoon I'm with Kara Walshefler, a biological anthropologist, and she had a fantastic talk yesterday. First of all, let me ask you, what inspired you to choose this career path? Well, I knew from a pretty young age that I wanted to be an academic. I come from a pretty long line of teachers, mm -hmm. and I sort of ran through all the possible jobs I thought would be appropriate, and I thought learning and teaching was what suited me best and something that I could do for an entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so when I was in school, I fell in love right away with biology. And then in university, it was biology specifically applied to people that really struck me as something that would just keep me interested. Humans are such an interesting blend of biological creature, but also so... Um, buffered by their mm -hmm. environment, by culture, and I was just really interested in how cultural buffer buffering um, can help, but not always help all the way, and so how could people um, physiologically and morphologically balance all of the selection pressures, considering that in some cases they could have culture and in some cases they couldn't, and so then... I went into a program in biological anthropology for my postgraduate work that really brought those two together and looked at how modern people in different parts of the world uh, balance heavy pressures from their environment mm -hmm. with sometimes um, helpful cultural adaptations that really uh, promote their um, their health and their well-being and then cultural practices that really don't and then what are some of the difficulties of those situations and then I also got involved in studying uh, a, a longer history of humanity looking specifically at human evolution and I was just incredibly interested in Neanderthals as a closely related species that actually did go extinct whose balance between culture and biology didn't allow them to live past a certain time. And obviously, they were a successful species, but I think by most measures that we would use, not as successful as us. Mm -hmm. And so what were sort of the cultural biological tensions for Neanderthals? What were those cultural biological tensions for modern humans when they were living in the same time in the same place? And why did we see one population really be more successful so that's sort of how it, how it happened for, that I landed on this particular research project. And yesterday you, you, you talked about the differences between Neanderthals and humans. You focused mm -hmm. specifically on Europe and Africa, but I noticed mm -hmm. on your map there was an area of, of Asia. Yeah. Um, is this a difficult place to have a look at? What, why did you not look at this yesterday? Yeah. Yesterday I was specifically interested in regions where we have excellent data on humans, sort of anatomically modern homo sapiens, coming into contact with a contemporaneous species that's closely related to them, the Neanderthals. That definitely had to have existed in Asia. Modern humans are absolutely in Asia at about the same time mm -hmm. point, interacting with a species that is probably something like Homo erectus. But the, the resolution of the data in that particular geographic area just isn't good enough yet for us to make some of these more finely grained um, models and understandings of what happened. But those data are definitely coming, and maybe in the future we'll be able to talk a little bit more about the interactions that we see there. Is it more difficult to travel there, or are there more constraints from the government? Or For a long period of time, well, I think, that, I think that there are a lot of things, I think it's a really interesting question. There are definitely a lot of things that have been going on historically. There definitely was a time period um, pre-World War II where this was an enormously important area. There were incredibly important, um, particularly German anatomists who mm -hmm. were there, paleontologists who were studying the Chinese fossil record. And then um, sort of post-World War II, China really closed off mm -hmm. um, to people publishing in English, in German, in French. And so there was a period of time where we just didn't hear a lot about what was coming out of either China or the Soviet Union. And now those areas have opened up quite a bit. And we are just learning so much more about what Homo erectus was like for the million and a half years of its living there. 
and definitely we're hoping to see some of the information about what very, very early homo sapiens when they arrive in Asia are actually doing. So yeah, a lot of it has to do primarily with historical reasons. And then simultaneously, Africa was quite open. Um, and so you just have a, a very long history of, of course, the Leakies being some of the most important and influential who are just f discovering and publishing and sharing. Mm -hmm. And we have such a rich record from Africa that it, it creates a, a much more clear picture. And of course, the same is going to be true in Europe where everybody is doing archaeology and publishing mm -hmm. in these key ways that everyone can, can um, read about and and thus use in their own assessments of the picture. And talking about having things that you can look at, you looked at different types of technology mm -hmm. to explore the differences between humans and Neanderthals. What, what does this technology show us about them? Yeah, so we compared a couple of different types of technology. I think some of the most interesting are when we're actually comparing what Neanderthals are doing and what anatomically modern humans are doing as they meet together in Europe. And as a general rule, we find um, anatomically modern humans doing um, a slightly more advanced technology. And what that means is that they have a more diverse toolkit. Their toolkit tends to have a wider variety of tools. Mm -hmm. And some of these tools do highly specialized activities like sewing leather. Um, creating um, puncture marks in hides, uh, fish hooks for gaining access to difficult to acquire resources like fish. We don't see that specialization to that extent among the Neanderthal tool types that are existing at the same time. You, you also looked at cave drawings and statues, so mm -hmm. art. Mm -hmm. um, what significance and um, what do they open our eyes to? Yeah, so again, setting up some sort of comparison between what we see anatomically modern humans doing versus what Neanderthals were doing at the same time in the same place. And what seems to be really clear is that the humans are um, quite quickly upon their arrival into Europe showing dramatic representations of the animals mm -hmm. that are living there with these extremely elegant and detailed drawings on the cave walls. Additionally, we're seeing um, physical representations of some of these animals with statues and figurines of mammoths and other creatures that they are obviously seeing. And then right around sort of 35,000 years ago, we begin to see actual statues and figurines of things that they haven't actually seen in real life. And this is actually a quite remarkable piece of the archeological record in Europe that you see creations of things that are imaginative and things like the lion-headed man, for example, and other uh, pictures on some of the walls like at Chauvet and really even the Venus figurines, these dramatically sexualized female figures that are not representing an actual woman, but some idea of woman's strength or power or fertility that, that humans are, are putting imagination to. And so we don't see anything like that among the Neanderthals, nothing like that at all. They do have some evidences of ornamentation and of um, uh, artifacts that we might say represent sort of group structure or um, differential power within a group, something where you would honor somebody by giving them some ornament. We do see that very, very late. Many would argue me included sort of after their contact with humans, but nothing imaginative like we see among, among the modern humans who are in that area at the same time. So I, I wonder then, your research obviously opens our eyes to evolution and things like that, but um, drawing on these symbols, what are the religious implications yeah. of your research? I, I think that that is another really good question of yours. I think that... I think that some of our expectations for how religiosity emerges and what, um, what we would need in terms of... Um, 
a cognitive structure in order to think about things that you don't necessarily ha are able to touch. Mm -hmm. Things like power mm -hmm. and influence, um, which are definitely some of um, the things that sort of crop up in a lot of early religions. That imagination is definitely witnessed by some of these imaginative artifacts. So why would you put the head of a lion on a man? It, it, it suggests some idea of power. And so where does that power come from? How can we control that power? If you carry this figurine, is some of that power transferred to you? And again, the same with Venus figure at figurines, which I think many people would suggest are representative of a, fertility, a, a concern about fertility, a want to be able to offer fertility to other people, a talisman, if you will. And so I think that all of these are clues that some sort of spirituality, at least, is definitely existing in human populations at this time in this location. And I suppose my final question would be, um, has this research and the journey you've gone through with your scientific mm -hmm. career, mm -hmm. has this influenced your faith at all? Um, well, I think that it's, Im I think that it's important to be uh, reflective on everything that you do. And, and definitely my research is something I love and I get a huge amount of enjoyment and satisfaction about thinking about these things. Um, I think that there are a couple of things that are interesting to me, just from sort of a very basic, very personal level. I think when we think about our relationship with God and uh, maybe worry or struggle with this idea that we are doubting or we're not quite the person that God wants us to be or we're not quite sure what path to take and everything feels very immediate. Mm -hmm and uh, um, concerning, I think when I think about everything that sort of God has waded through and gone through before we even emerged, I think God can be pretty patient with as we sort of struggle with some of the things that are probably actually quite small. And so just sort of a sense of, of overwhelming patience, I think is something every time I don't just think about our fossil record or our evolutionary history, but when you think about everything that's come before us, um, I, I think that it just gives a much sense of, I don't, I don't think that it's insignificant, but just that God appreciates lots and lots of aspects of creation and not just us. And while God definitely has a personal relationship with us, God clearly has the patience to help us and work with us through things that are really concerning us. And while we think this has been sort of a year that I've been puzzled with this, a year mm -hmm. out of like, you know, six million years that bipeds have been on the earth, it seems like a small, a small thing. And so it's humbling and it's gratifying and it's, um, it just makes me really thankful that God can have that kind of patience, I think. Well, it's been a pleasure to hear your talk yesterday and an Thank even you. bigger pleasure to talk with you today. Thank you. And our listeners can watch the full talk um, well, when it's published. So thank Excellent. you very much. I My wish pleasure. you a safe trip home and I really hope you come back to the Faraday again. Thank, Thank you. Please invite me. Thank you.